No, the fact is that I think neo-Darwinism is dead. The following are conversations with Dennis Noble, a pioneer of systems biology, who built one of the first computer programs for modeling human organs. In 1960, he discovered how heartbeats emerge by self-generating electrical feedback loops. His groundbreaking work shaped our understanding of heart function and led to treatments for heart conditions that we use today. Throughout his career, Noble had deep misgivings about the prevailing theory of evolution. His current ideas and research are both angering his peers and inspiring the next generation of Origins of Life researchers to re-examine how he came into existence in a theory that, as we'll build to in this conversation, takes purpose and creativity as fundamental. Neo-Darwinism that became the selfish gene, aka the modern synthesis or gene-centered theory of evolution, is that all the same thing? That's it. That's the best definition you've just given it, yes. I just thought that was evolution. Uh, I see. Okay. Well, New Darwinism is, of course, a theory of evolution, but it's not Darwin's theory, despite the name. That will be a shock to many people. I've studied Darwin very carefully. I've also studied the 19th century people who began to disagree with him. They took Darwin's idea and developed it by making an assumption that they could not prove, which is precisely this. There is a barrier. It's sometimes called the Weissman barrier, and it is absolute. Nothing can go across it. The Weissman barrier was foundational in the development of evolutionary biology and modern genetics. In the 1800s, biologist and neo-Darwinist August Weissman hypothesized that there's a strict barrier that separates all the cells in our body that die when we do from the immortal germ cells that produce sperm and eggs, transporting genetic information from one generation to the next in a process that goes back to the beginning of life and can theoretically go on forever. Over the years, new evidence has challenged the strictness of the Weissman barrier. But for Noble, new evidence doesn't just challenge the strictness of the barrier. It undermines the idea that there was ever a barrier at all. Why was that assumption made? This is what I'm trying to work out at the moment. I'm actually in the process of reading those 19th century texts. One answer would be that it would be a way of excluding the alternative theory of evolution, which was Lamarck, the French biologist who preceded Darwin by 50 years. Lamarck thought that as the giraffe reaches up to be able to eat the leaves at the top of the tree, it grows its neck, as it were, by sending messages to its eggs or sperm to make the next generation even taller. Now, he may have been wrong about the giraffe. We don't have to take the examples that Lamarck sometimes used as fully illustrating his idea. His idea was the same as Darwin's. Of course, Lamarck did not know about natural selection, but Darwin did. He was the originator of the idea together with Wallace. But in addition to natural selection, he realized there had to be something else. So he was looking for an additional process which could go on in addition to natural selection. And that's why he was keen on the idea of Lamarck, which is that some features of the influence of the environment directly on organisms could be inherited via the germline. That was the key to Darwin's nuancing, if you like, of his theory, and which people like Wallace and Weissman decided they wanted to get rid of. I'm trying to understand why they wanted to distance themselves from Lamarck. In Darwin's hands, that idea that the body does communicate with its germline, Darwin was convinced that that was the case. And he's been vindicated recently. In the last 20 years, we have found physiological work has shown that control processes, RNAs that control the genes in our body, do pass from the body to the germline. So first thing to say very clearly is the Weissman barrier doesn't exist. So it was an assumption that it was there and it was necessarily true that it was there. But it was an attempt 
to simplify the process of bee evolution to be only natural selection. So Occam's razor. Yes, it's Occam's razor, where you don't need a more complicated hypothesis, make it simple. Now, unfortunately, life doesn't behave like that. And Occam's razor is just a principle for practicality, right? It's it's Indeed, it's a principle which we should respect, but respect with care. Because once you find that there is more than one process going on, you don't go on denying it, just because you want it to be the simplest process possible. If the simplest model I created in 1960 was actually fully correct, we would be dead. You developed the first mathematical model of cardiac cells in the 1960s? That's correct. Based on experiments, not just a mathematical theory. It was actually experimentally based, just as the Hodgkin-Huxley nerve impulse was. My examiner was Alan Hodgkin. <laughs> I remember my, my supervisor, Otto, telling me, Dennis, you better be right, because you know Alan Hodgkin was like a great god to physiologists in those days. You better be right, otherwise we've, we've all got egg on our faces. Alan was fantastic. In those days, you had to queue up to use a huge valve computer, not even with uh, semiconductors. These were valves, like light bulbs, all acting as, as switches in an well, I didn't know what it was, an array of maybe 20,000 of these. You then had to queue up to ask for time on this computer, which was itself a, a, a marvel. 1960, the, the very earliest days of valve computers, I didn't even know how to program them. I thought I could take my equations to the people who ran this machine and say, can you put these into the computer? Said, oh, no, uh, Mr. Noble, I, I was not even Dr. Noble then. You need to buy a computer manual for mamas. We, you can go away yourself and learn how to program the computer, which is what I did. But I wrote, as far as I know, one of the very first programs for generating a biological function on a computer. And this influenced our modern understanding of heart functions, which has significantly impacted um, biomedical research and how modern medicine treats heart disease, which is one of the leading killers. Yeah, it was the first time that anybody had reproduced the rhythm, the electrical rhythm of the heart, without having an oscillator there to create it. It is sui generis. It generates itself. Once you put the equations in for the different ion channels and how they affect the global cell, cell voltage, which is a global property of the cell, it is automatic, which is why I'm very sympathetic to Stuart Kaufman's idea that uh, life is an auto-catalytic process. Stuart Kaufman is a complexity scientist, physician, theoretical biologist, and influential figure in origins of life research. In 1971, he theorized about collectively autocatalytic sets, the spontaneous emergence of self-sustaining, self-creating, self-reproducing networks of molecules. His theory was later demonstrated experimentally, challenging gene centrism by validating the possibility that life can emerge, create, and sustain itself without the need for complex genetic information or template-based replication. Kaufman calls this a Kantian whole, after the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, the idea that the parts exist for and by means of the whole. This is contrasted with our current evolutionary gene-centric theory, where we are created by our genes and our genes are driving evolution. I've been interviewing Kaufman for a story, which is how I was introduced to Noble, as these two scientists independently found similar fundamental patterns of behavior that changed our understanding of how life works. A year and a half ago, I debated the whole question with the main exponent of neo-Darwinism, Richard Dawkins. Both he and I had been talking with each other. We have a, a sort of friendship between us for over, well, nearly 60 years, because I examined his thesis in 1966. The Selfish gene came out uh, 10 years later. Now, we both respect each other, but 
he was unable even to understand the molecular, biological, and cellular points and explanations that I was giving. He's a very skilled debater, so he goes off in another direction. Very convincing, if you don't realize he hasn't answered the question. And can we can we define our nutshell in plain English what genetic reductionism is? It's exactly what Richard says in his book, The Selfish Gene. Genes created us body and mind. So from knowing the genome, you'd be able to make me. I, I read very carefully his 40th anniversary edition of The Selfish Gene. First of all, the actual book is republished exactly as it was in 1976. Then he has an afterword, and the afterword is quite long and he's quite careful. And he says, it's a book on genetics, but genetics has transformed out of all proportions in the last 40 years. Why is the book still the same? And then he goes on to an extraordinary phrase. In some ways, I would like to find a way to recant the selfish gene. Darwin, he was looking for an additional process which could go on in addition to natural selection. That was Darwin's nuancing, if you like, of his theory, and which people like Wallace and Weissman decided they wanted to get rid of. Would, would another reason for wanting to get rid of that and to lean into genetic reductionism is because science is about reductionism, at least in physics and chemistry. Yeah. Scientific reductionism is an approach of trying to understand bigger things by breaking them down into their simpler, fundamental parts. It's used to understand causation, or how small things like particles and chemical reactions can cause or create big things. But reductionism has its limitations when it comes to explaining emergence, where something new suddenly comes into existence in complex systems. This new emergent phenomena can't be fully explained or predicted by looking at the underlying chemistry and physics. No, the fact is that I think neo-Darwinism is dead. Because we're not our genes and can't be reduced to our genes? Precisely. Now, Richard said it in the debate. He said, Dennis, we could carve all the A, C, T's and G's into a granite block. We'll have the whole complete sequence of Dennis Noble. And we could keep that for 10,000 years. And then we will be able to recreate you. I stopped him and said, Richard, where are you going to get my mother's egg cell as it existed in 1936? So, oh, yes, we would need it. Well, we'll be able to do that by then. Well, you know, t just a moment. <laughs> that was a very... Uh, I mean, all of our DNA, all of our cells in our body are highly unique. There will never be an exactly you or an exactly me. Nor will a clone be the same, because if you just know the DNA without having the inherited egg cell from a particular person at a particular time, you won't have that individual. So you can't recreate no. your mother's egg cell from that time influenced by all of these outside factors that would have changed it so in I the future. So you can't recreate an never really create that. We are all of us. You know, the number of possible combinations of three billion base pairs is way, way beyond the total material in the whole universe. So it's just simply impossible. The great majority of the population of the world is a tiny fraction of the total number of possible genomes that could exist with three billion base pairs. Noble's work contributed significantly to the discovery of biological robustness, where other genes, biological parts, or mechanisms take over the function of a gene or network of genes. This ability requires an understanding of function at the system level, not the gene level. As I developed the heart pacemaker model to include more genes and more proteins in the models, it grew into a more complete description of a heart cell, what we found was very interesting. You could remove one of the key elements causing the rhythm, and the rhythm would still carry on. 
and that can be shown experimentally too. So what's happening is that if the organism finds that this gene is absent, it uses another pathway to do exactly the same thing. It's, in other words, it's robust because it's got more than one mechanism by which it can achieve its need. It's got the ability to be so robust that you can remove a gene that is critical to the normal rhythm of the heart, but the heart rhythm will still continue. How does that affect the rest of the body and relate to disease? 95% of genes produce only very modest association levels between the presence or absence of that variant of the gene and the disease state. What that means is that most of the time, that kind of robustness that I found in the heart pacemaker occurs elsewhere too. The difference, or rather the exceptions, the outlier 5% or so of us, are those who've got a genuinely monogenetic disease, a disease that rises from a single gene, like the gene miss variant for cystic fibrosis being present, in which case you will necessarily get cystic fibrosis. But those correspond to only about 5% of the total population. And, and just to spell this out, if you can remove a gene, that means the gene-centric view cannot be true because there's a prioritization of the, the organism the priority in determining what happens is at the organism level. This is back to the holistic view that I think Stuart Kaufman is also proposing. We, you have to see a living system as what he calls a Kantian whole. That sounds like a deep philosophical point. But it's actually very simple. The purpose of the individual molecules and genes comes from understanding the whole. Without that, you don't know why those components are there. And so is this why genetic determinism, you you don't think that's possible? The test has already been done. In the British Medical Journal, Medicine, in October last year, a team from the University College London, led by a gentleman called Ingorani, one of the scientists leading this project, they subjected the whole of the polygenic scores, that is, all the scores in the polygenic repository, where you can download all the scores of association between this gene and this function and add them together, which is why it's called polygenic. So they subjected that to the same criteria as a clinical trial of a drug. Is it predictive? Can it tell you which disease you will get? Can it tell you how you would cure it? The answer is no. This is the biggest trial that's been done on the output of the Human Genome Project. It's a failure in cardiovascular disease. It's a failure in cancer. Those account for 60% of the deaths of people. So you don't have to ask me the question, you know, could one show that it's wrong? It's already been shown to be wrong. I spoke with the lead scientist of this study, a genetic epidemiologist who didn't want to go on camera. But basically, your polygenic risk score adds up your gene variants and gives you a total score for how likely you are to get a common disease. His study shows polygenic risk scores aren't good at predicting who's going to get a common disease because the majority of people who get common diseases don't have a high risk score. So gene variants aren't predictive, yet genes are still causal, and here's why. This is going to be a super simplified explainer, but to try to make it easier to understand, we're going to consider a gene that I'm just going to call Fred. Now we all have a version of the Fred gene, and all Fred genes make Fred proteins. Some people have a version of Fred that pumps out an excess of Fred proteins, and this allows scientists to see that a lot of Fred proteins leads to elevated LDL cholesterol levels, which is causally linked to heart disease. So scientists make a drug that inhibits anyone's FRED from making FRED proteins. So now anyone with elevated LDL cholesterol can take a FRED inhibitor to block their FRED. Now we all have a FRED gene, and because FRED's proteins can cause elevated LDL cholesterol linked to heart disease, it means the FRED gene is causally linked to heart disease, even if heart disease is multifactorial, meaning thousands of factors are causal contributors to heart disease. 
very obvious that scientists have got to recognize different forms of causation. And you've got to distinguish between them, otherwise there's a terrible muddle. Active differs from passive causation. Aristotle actually divided it up into round four. I add another two, because coding is a kind of cause. The cause that arises because of a form, and the DNA as a sequence is a form, is not the same kind of causation as Newtonian things banging into each other. That is active causation. I'm saying that active causation in organisms is the function of proteins, not of genes. That does not mean that genes are not causal. Um, because they make the proteins. Because they make a protein, precisely, yes. Noble agrees that genes are causal contributors to disease, and genetic research has been instrumental in developing drugs to treat diseases. But even the genetic epidemiologist who ran the polygenic risk score study said that at the moment, there are very few diseases that are possible to cure. But here's the thing. Noble's research has shown adaptive and functionally flexible causation in biology, where various other genes in the network and even non-genetic mechanisms like RNA, hormones, and microorganisms jump in and compensate for a bum gene without missing even a heartbeat. So instead of focusing on genetic reductionism, where we try to break a person apart and sift through the thousands or hundreds of thousands of different genetic and non-genetic factors that might causally contribute to disease, Noble is suggesting we look at the whole person and the variety of ways we may be able to restore function. The biological nature of causation challenges genetic determinism. In the U.S., Congress had to enact the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA, in 2008 to prevent employers and health insurance companies from discriminating against people based on flawed, oversimplified assumptions about the causal relationship between genes, traits, behaviors, and disease, which the polygenic risk score study suggests might be a confusion about causation in biology. As far as I'm aware, biomedical research relies on reductionism. How do we do science? How do we do important research if reductionism turns out to be seriously inadequate? Well, i sorry to do an advert, but I've written the explanation for that. It, understanding living systems. Should that be required reading for all medical students? Do you think we need an overhaul of our... I, well, this is what this says. We need to change our, our biology. Yes, I'm not the only person to say that. I just published in February a review of a book by Philip Ball, a scientific correspondent and one-time editor of Nature. Um, it's published in Nature on the 8th of February. And it's simply called Genes Are Not the Blueprint for Life. Ball concludes that... We are at the beginning of a profound rethinking of how life works. Philip Ball, um, he's written a much longer book than mine. This is quite short. It's just 150 pages and it's extremely simple. His is a kind of guide for the working biologist to what he calls the new biology. That's the phrase he uses. If genes are not the blueprint, what is the blueprint? There isn't one. That's the point. You see... You can only get life from life. Let me qualify that. I'm not opposing the idea, and I know that Stuart Kaufman and others are very keen on exploring it, that somehow it's a natural process for life to emerge on a planet. That seems to me to be perfectly the way to go and to work out what are the conditions in which autocatalytic sets can start, in which membranes can exist, and once all of that's happened, bang, you're off and life is developing, evolution then will take you the rest of the way. I'm not opposed to, uh, to any of that story at all. What I am saying, though, is this. Once life has taken off, to ask the question, where does the purpose of the living system come from? Where does its agency, its ability to go this way rather than that way, to choose how to find its food, how to mate, and all the rest of it, which incidentally Darwin was also very keen on in thinking about his ideas about what he called sexual selection. It doesn't make sense to say, how on earth does something like purpose arise from simple chemistry? 
I'm saying that that is a process which you can only take as the whole. It's the whole that gives the purpose to the parts. How does that derive from evolution? How does that, how, how does, I mean, this is such a basic question that, I, you know, I think we just take for granted because we are purposive beings, but how would an, would purpose be a function of an organism? It's a, it's a, it's a process that has evolved. It wasn't there before. So are you in the same camp that functions are this emergent property in biological systems? Functions are emergent properties, yes. The function to feed, the function to reproduce, the function to perform any of the things that we do which characterize what we call living, all of those are something that has emerged from the chemistry of the world, not there before. Is it correct to regard organisms as purposive? And it seems utterly incredible to anybody who say they're not. Evolution has generated purpose, and that's what the neonaries do not like at all. To them, it seems to give wind to their creationist opponents, which of course is a form of theism. Would, would the concern be, and maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but if evolution can act on an organism top down and develop purpose, and it's not subject to reductionism, it almost seems like you could take a step back and, and have a teleological explanation for evolution, like a purposive... Oh, absolutely. There's a book just published by MIT by about 20 authors called Evolution on Purpose. Now we're coming to the deep rift between Darwin and his neo-Darwinist opponents, Wallace Weissman. They wanted to get rid of the concept of purpose. Darwin was entirely with it because what he saw in organisms like the peacock or in squid or in the octopus, what he saw was clearly purposive behavior. Now, the neo-Darwinists say, well, but that's just quaint 19th century anthropomorphic talking. Of course, he's no longer with us to answer, but I think Darwin's reply would be very much the same as I would give. No, the purpose has evolved. It's as simple as that. You don't have to suppose the purpose was there before the organisms existed. Um, the purpose is itself um, a, an evolution. Noble has proposed a theory of biological relativity where reductionist scientific approaches, which dominate physics and chemistry, and are used to determine causation, are insufficient for understanding living systems, from origins of life research to health, disease, and consciousness. Compounding evidence suggests life does not adhere to any privileged level of causation, nor does it conform to a purely Newtonian notion of causation. Aristotle said there's also what he called the final cause, which is indeed purpose. What he understood, I think, is that we as organisms can do something now that anticipates the future. How important is purpose to your theory? The existence of purposive agency in organisms is, in my view, the central point on which, in the end, the division occurs. How are you defining purpose? I think purpose is the use of charms to explore strategies for the future. It is, I've got this array of options in my repertoire um, because of the stochasticity of my uh, living system. As an organism, I am using that to try out, in a, a popper sense, in a sense, you know, I've got a hypothesis. This could be the future. This could be the way in which I go. Will it work? And the best way to do that is to try it out and see whether it does. So I think purpose can be given a very simple scientific definition. It doesn't have to rely on some kind of spiritualist or religious notion of purpose. I think that's a key because one of the big reasons why 
there's such a divide between uh, the evolutionary biologists and the creationists. Once you start to admit that, that organisms have purpose, the religious side will say, but there you are then, where did that purpose come from? I would say it came from me. <laughs> It came from me as an organism. So your view doesn't concern itself with a creator or intelligent designer? No, not at all. No, absolutely not. Uh, that's, that's not to say that those who believe that that is the case are necessarily wrong. I've no idea. Um, but what I can say is that I've no difficulty with attributing purpose to an organism like myself or to the cat, or to the mouse. And I, I, I don't see any reason why, because that sometimes is interpreted in a particular religious context, one has to avoid using the concept of purpose as a scientific concept. It goes to show that um, bias that we attribute to religious belief can be just as applicable to skepticism if you're not open-minded about evidence. Exactly. exactly so. Yes, because what's happening, I think, well, I I would sometimes say that Richard's position is very much like a religious position. It's got the following characteristics. He's dogmatic. He cannot consider that you might be wrong. Second, he's got the fantastic notion of original sin. We are born selfish. I, my goodness me, what do I understand what he is saying when he says that? Uh, Stu uh, is saying, are we in the middle of a third transition? And you have a third way of evolution. And it seems to be that there's That's a shift right. happening. If we're doing evolution acting top down on an organism, how is that explained by these underlying sciences that kind of explain how the universe works? In a sense, that's what I was doing in 1960 because people called this biophysics because I was using a physical model with all the cellular components necessary to let the model work to reproduce the biological process. So I am what some people in those days and still do call a biophysicist, uniting the two areas. I've been for a long time a editor of a journal called Progress in Biophysics. So, yes, I think that is the um, challenge, but now I come to the really important but, which destroys reductionism. What I was doing there in that model of the heart is what you have to do for all models in biology, which is that the higher levels of organization constrain what the molecular level does. Those constraints don't change the laws of the physics and chemistry of those molecules. Those laws are fixed. But whatever you do, if you put a number of molecules together in a chamber, like a cell or just uh, a bottle, the interactions will depend upon what we call the boundary conditions. That is, how the structure constrains what those molecules can do. Now look at the structure of a living cell. It is exceedingly, oh, it's like a terribly complex maze, membranous systems, almost filling all the space in the cell. That's why it doesn't feel like a bubble of water. It's, it's jelly-like. It's a bit like the sauces you mix up, which they can always stand on their own because they're so... They're so well structured. Cells are in infinitely complex in structure, and that is what constrains the molecules to do what they do. So even if you did a biophysical representation of what's going on, you are incorporating the, you have to call it this, the downward causation of the higher level of organization into the equations for the process, because the molecules bump into those membranes. They bump into those constraints. Constraint is not something which is non-physical, but it's nevertheless needed, and it's a description at the higher level of organization. So are biophysicists then, by definition, not neo-Darwinists because they're going whole organism down instead of genes up? 
Well, the, the this gets difficult, Andrea. Um, I, I don't think any neo-Darwinist would deny that all of that structure exists. So obviously, they have seen the electron microscopy of cells and know how complex our cells are. Certainly true. What they would say, though, is, yes, but that all develops from the DNA. Because of the central dogma of molecular biology, which is another great mistake of the 20th century. Sorry if that's going to shock you, but it's true. The central dogma, strictly speaking, says from a DNA sequence, I can make an RNA. And from that RNA, a special part of the cell, the ribosome, can make a protein. So it uses the code in the DNA transferred into RNA to make a protein with its sequence of amino acids. Now, that central dogma view is correct. I'm not going to challenge that any, any way at all. Where it became incorrect was the way the neo-Darwinists interpreted it, because they thought they got the equivalent at the molecular level of the Weissmann barrier the barrier between the body and the germline. Some biologists criticize Noble by claiming biological developments have been accepted and integrated into the modern synthesis. But as recently as 2017, a peer reviewer at a scientific journal responded to one of Noble's papers saying, the Weissmann barrier, as now embodied by the central dogma of molecular biology, has not yet been falsified. Noble says that he asked that the comments from the peer reviewer be published, but the request was denied. Now, that sequence from knowing the DNA to the RNA to the protein tells you nothing about what controls the DNA. We now know that an army of RNAs do so. Where are they generated? They're generated by the epigenetic processes in our cellular organ and tissue structures, which are in effect telling the genome what to do. Worse than that, they can do something which the neo-Darwinists don't like at all, change the DNA. Just ask what was happening during the pandemic. Our immune systems encountering a coronavirus they've never seen before, and let's forget about vaccines for a moment, let's look at the natural process. Our immune system, recognizing there was a new invader, was busy telling the immune system cells, please mutate as rapidly as possible in just that part of the genome that creates the grabbing part of the immunoglobulin, that's the protein, that grabs the virus. Create a million new versions. Then we will select the one that grabs the virus. And that's precisely what the immune system does. It changes the genome. Not supposed to be possible happens all the time. The conventional take on this is that these changes to the DNA are still the result of natural selection, just a sped up warp speed version of natural selection inside the body. Dennis is saying, no, the organism is the one turbocharging natural selection and using it to fight off an invader. So the organism is doing natural selection on purpose. Can I ask, I love this story and I hope it's true. It's a theory that I've, I've read that viruses started off as living cells that were parasites on other living cells. And then evolution was like, you don't need to be alive to be a parasite and de-evolved life out of its gene pool. Hey, that's quite possible, yes. And I'm not, not necessarily opposing that theory. No, that's right. What that meant is that they couldn't live outside a body. So life for the organism was just a trait. It's a process. That's, so, so viruses are literally the undead. They're, they, they're dead outside a cell, yes. They're living inside a cell because they've got the ability to code for the protein that enables them to reproduce. So that is a real theory. That, 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 that's no, that's not a theory anymore. We know. No, wait, that's true. That that they were once alive and then they de. Well, okay, no, no, we we can't be sure of that. I think the better way to put it, Andrea, would be to say, it's quite possible that that's how viruses 
started as forms of life that realized they didn't need to carry around the whole panoply of a cell in order to exist because they can exist as a viral particle outside a cell, but they can only reproduce inside a cell. Interesting. So so evolution can work on an organism to n make it no longer an organism. Well, evolution has often done that. The fact is that we life has regressed quite frequently into simpler life forms. So the idea that viruses might have arisen in the same way that they found, if you like to put it that way, that they could exist as spores, viral spores outside a cell, but whenever they managed to get inside a cell to attack a cell and get into it, they could reproduce. Well, automatically they would go on surviving. So every time we get infected, we reproduce them. So they can reproduce without being alive. Like I understand regression, but regression to the point of no longer being alive? I think so, yes. Wow. How should we put it? Put those viruses on a completely nascent planet with no life on it at all. They would just stay there for billions of years. We're doing nothing. Because there would be nothing to let them reproduce. And only a living cell can do that. When they uh, parasitically attach to us, they don't become alive. They're still non-living. Is that right? That's a very interesting question. What is alive? Uh, I'm not playing jokes here. Um, inside a cell, a molecule, because that's what a, a virus is, it's a DNA molecule, perhaps with a little bit of protein around it. So it's simply molecules. Now, in our cells too, it's incorrect to say that our molecules are alive. Our cells are alive because, coming back to Stu's ideas, they are Kantian holes. That's what he would define as the potential for being a living system. So the best way I would put it would be to say any of the molecules in our cells outside the cell is dead. Viruses are a particular example of that. As molecules, just DNA, they are dead. But when they're in a cell, they are part of a living process. And that living process now includes the replication of the virus. So it's inaccurate to say we give them life. They are altering our life. Their entry into us has altered our life and possibly even killed it. Yes, exactly. So essentially, evolution is acting on the whole to develop functions. If yes. it's doing that and the functions are that important, their functions serve the purpose of the whole. Would there be a way for evolution to work on the whole that isn't purposeful? Because functions themselves have ingrained purposeness. And yes, they're ingrained with purpose. You can't have a function which doesn't have a purpose. No, I think that's absolutely correct. So, so purposiveness then is is sort of ingrained in evolution. It's part of the evolutionary process. I think it is. Yes, that's right. Yes, and I think that was true from the earliest cells. So purpose then is, is an objective part of the evolutionary process. I think it's a, an objective thing and it can be therefore investigated scientifically. Exactly so. And it's been my purpose for the last seven years to try in articles to, first of all, explain how significant the harnessing of stochasticity is, how it's undeniable in the case of the immune system. I think it's also undeniable in the case of the nervous system and how it is that that gives organisms the purpose that they show. In the immune system, of course, it's not a single cell that is doing it because it can't. Any single cell in the process is, is totally chance whether it gets the right immunoglobulin or not. It's the recognition by the system as a whole that these cells are the ones that should be told to reproduce. The rest are given the autophagy signal. So there is a non-conscious awareness of yes, the value right. of these. Oh, inter Precisely so. Th that we are not conscious of this. That's obviously so. But it is cognition in the sense that it's intelligent 
It's selecting precisely those cells from the immune system that succeeded in making the immunoglobulin needed. Let me ask you then, why Why do you think we just go, but it's not conscious? Like, we don't know what consciousness is. We don't necessarily have to make sure it's only this one thing. We will say it's intelligent, it's cognition, it's this, it's problem solving. Why do we take consciousness out of it? Do you think it's potentially like, hey, maybe it could be? But let me, <clears throat> let me see what I can do with that. First, I've no difficulty with purposiveness being unconscious. Now, that raises the question, why then do we also have conscious processes that can be said to be our intentions? I don't think it's correct for me to say that because my immune system creates the right immunoglobulin to attack the virus that I intended to make that immunoglobulin. I think that's a misuse of intentional language. So there is a clear division here. An unconscious process that uses the harnessing of stochasticity to produce purposive behavior is not necessarily intentional. I think that's the way I would put it in philosophical terms. Interesting. That's clearly so, because the immune system is not conscious. How do we know? Not, well, now that's a very good question, Andrea. Uh, we don't know, so it's not our consciousness. No, absolutely. Oh, oh, I like that <laughs> distinction. Okay, so all we can say for sure is we're not consciously doing it ourselves, whatever our is and selves is, yeah. but our well, bodies well, are. Ask the following question. We uh, exist because cells came together and found the mechanism to be uh, assembling themselves into structures that is a body that has different functions for the different cell types. Now, all of those cells were at one time, in going way back in the evolutionary process, isolated single cells. There are even organisms that go through stages in their life cycle in which they are just free-floating amoeba-like single cells and then come together to form the very elaborate spore-forming process to reproduce the colony, if you want to call it that. So we've all, as multicellular organisms, derived from single cells that came together. Now, the single cell itself is clearly cognitive. It's got a, a bacterium it has many cognitive features in what it does. And I think it's correct to use the word cognition about it, about it. I don't know what it must be like to be a bacterium, but I don't even know what it must be like to be a bat, to quote another famous philosopher. And I don't think I need to know that. What I need to know is that the evolutionary process has somehow found a way in which my consciousness is not the consciousness of my particular cells. It's something that has emerged from the coming together of a vast number of cells in a single organism, a multicellular organism. And it makes perfect sense to me that part of those processes are not open to my conscious intent. I don't see why they, it should. Can we define cognitive-based evolution, CBE? Sure. It's an alternative to neo-Darwinism. Uh, it, it proposes cellular intelligence. Cells are capable of measuring and responding to their environment. It redefines life as fundamental based on cognitive abilities of cells. And evolution is continuous, non-random process where cells solve problems to adapt and survive. Yeah. It seems to me that it's correct to say, just as AI is cognitive, it's a form of cognition which is enabling a solution to a question. Can you write this essay for me on XYZ? 
And uh, life is certainly doing the same kind of thing. So I've no hesitation in describing a cell as cognitive. I've no hesitation in describing our nervous systems as cognitive. And I don't see why we should have any hesitation in doing that. I think we want to be special in our brains. We want to think that there's this little special <laughs> orb in our head <laughs> that has all these special properties that are make us very unique. If we attribute that to AI, I can't see why we shouldn't attribute it to an even more complicated <clears throat> process, which is the living cell. The harnessing of stochasticity is a purposive process, and therefore it could also be another definition of a purpose. Interesting. That's interesting. Um, that's really that, interesting. That's, that's how you can get, you see, the neutral description is the harnessing of stochasticity, and the immune system people will be totally happy with that. Um, I go on a bit further and say, but that is precisely what organisms are doing when they are behaving purposefully. They're also harnessing stochasticity. Now, where you define the edge between no purpose and purpose, that, that's a philosophical question which I'm very happy to debate at length. Well, it may be philosophical at this point, but it's really important for science. Like, it's just not touched yet. I, I think because we don't know how to eat define it, test it, whatever it is. But so when you say purpose evolved, like consciousness. Purposiveness and consciousness have themselves developed and become more and more uh, impressive. No doubt about that. So we're looking at a process continually enriching what the possibilities are. But I think if one starts asking the question, was the earliest cell purely mechanical? I don't think it can have been. That's interesting. So, so because that was one of my questions: is if it's if purpose is a part of evolution, and we know that evolution is what brings life into existence, how did purpose then evolve from life? Like how how does how does purpose be part of evolution even before life? I guess is what I'm asking. That's asking the origin of life question, isn't it, which we have not solved. Um, we'll skip it. <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm afraid, is difficult. Some people think that the earliest stages at which autocatalytic networks, which is the first stage of a possibility of a process that continues all the time to continue to create itself and to maintain itself, that's what we mean by autocatalytic. That could have happened in the way some people describe it, in the deep fissures of the rocks of the earth, so that the maintaining of the autocatalytic network in a restricted space might have been a geological feature. But at some stage, those autocatalytic networks acquired membranes. Once they've got membranes, they've got purpose. Because you see, there's constraint by the membrane itself. That is what is maintaining the integrity of that network. It doesn't disperse out into the general solution. It stays within that cell uh, structure. So purpose emerges because it's constrained within a, an, an agent, an entity. That's how you sort of get purpose out of it is because it's... Exactly. And it becomes an individual because of that. Before that happened, it would be, well, autocatalytic networks forming by chance within what we describe as the primal soup of the ocean. Um, but it would be temporary. It would just disperse itself. You've got to some stage to constrain it. You've got somehow or another to encapsulate it so it is an individual, not just a mass of reactions. So purpose has to be contained. That's really interesting. Um, so, so what is non-conscious purpose? What is it? Is that a process? Is it a thing? Like, what is that? Well, it's certainly not a thing. I don't think life is a thing either. You see, I think it's a process. I, I think this is one of the big difficulties that the neo-Darwinists have, and. It, at, at root, it is a philosophical difficulty. As I see it, you see, um, 
If you were given all the molecular processes, molecular elements rather, um, as uh, already listed and within this structure, which is the cell, um, you wouldn't have described what is happening. Because simply enumerating what there is there cannot do that. It's the structure of the processes and processes do have structures. They have ways in which they move around the network. That is a process, not a thing. And that's a fundamental difference between the ontology of things and the ontology of processes. That's that's also really interesting. So so I was when I was thinking about purpose and I was trying to sort of parse it apart from the knee-jerk reaction that theists have or creationists have and science has about what it is. Do you think we have this sort of very limited or ill-defined definition of purpose because it has for us when we when we intersect with it, it has feels, like it has a feeling to it. So it might be more than that. Like it might be a non-conscious process, but to us we experience it as a feeling. So we think, oh, it's this like conscious qualia property. And you're saying it's a process. It's the process, exactly, yes. Well, and we can describe it, you see. If I go back to the heart rhythm, I would say, this channel opens, ions go through and create a voltage change which makes this channel close and that other one over there open and that creates more current flow and eventually the current flows are such that the voltage goes back to where it was at the beginning and the whole process can start again and you end up with beautiful cardiac rhythm. You see, I can describe all of that in purely mechanical terms, but it's still a process. It didn't need an oscillator. The process itself generates the oscillation and you don't need to have something there that is forcing it to go up and down. There's nothing there forcing it to go up and down. It just emerges from the properties. But there's nothing ghostly about that because what we're opposing is anything that says, once you attribute purpose to something, you are automatically uh, committing yourself to a kind of Cartesian dualism. There has to be a ghost in the machine. <laughs> Well, we're saying uh, there's none. The only thing that's there are these processes which automatically generate those processes that matter for life. It's so funny because pro processes sound very kind of um, boring. Uh, for me, I don't believe in a God. I don't believe in much of anything. But life and that process is magical. Like it's, it's. I know. It is incredible. I've got a banana a plant growing in my garden at the moment and it's putting up these extraordinary whirls of um, you know that eventually create the the banana leaves you, you could then characterize all the mathematical equations you could say it's using of course it's not using any mathematical equations and i would say on that you see that nowhere in that process is there a ghost the modern synthesis also called neo-darwinism says that unguided processes over millions and billions of years shape the evolution of complex living systems. And attributing purpose to evolution and networks of cells is anthropomorphizing, which is ascribing human characteristics or behavior to non-human things like animals, objects, or processes. However, there's an alternative take on all this. It's that our own experience of purpose is an anthropomorphizing of an objective process or organizing principle that is essential and fundamental to all living systems, from cells to organisms to communities of organisms and to whole biospheres. The process within it, just as I found in the heart cell work that I did way back in 1960, it just emerges from the process itself. It is the thing, if you want to call it that. So, but it's a, exactly. it's, so it's a kind of a, a brain breaker because it, a designer sort of implies an external intelligence, but with purpose, the organism designs itself. You just need three or four billion years. So in your view too, with this Kantian whole, then it still takes the billions of years of evolution, like RNA world theory, where it just takes so long for this RNA to finally get to the point where 
life yes. then can spontaneously arrive in an autocatalytic set? Or I think that the chances are that the earliest stages were at least a billion years. I mean, that's the period for which we know life existed, but there's extremely little evidence, fossil evidence of that being the case. So you're not um, incompatible with neo-Darwinism entirely. Like, it just seems like it's, um, there's just more to the story. Well, except that they made a, a few rather critical mistakes, you see. The Weissman barrier, which was a cornerstone, has gone. The central dogma interpreted to mean that organisms do not change the DNA has gone. So the differences are assumptions, like there were just assumptions put on this model. Um, well, yes, in a sense you're right. You know, if you asked what was Weissman's evidence for the barrier, he said it must exist. I've got all the quotes on that. You can have as many quotes as you like. And if you remove the assumptions, do you, does it totally make room for what you're saying? Yes. Why do you think neo-Darwinists would dig into something that there's so little you have to get up, give up if you just get rid of those? You're quite right, and I'm writing a book at the moment trying to say exactly that. What do you really disagree with me on? You know, let's go through the list. I've just gone through a few of in the list. You see the, uh, the Weissman barrier, gone. Um, the idea that um, genes alone are sufficient to create us, gone. Um, no, no, I think it's a very good question, but I think that becomes a sociological question, and there are sociologists asking that question. Well, I, I feel like when I, I of course, we rewatched the quote-unquote debate with you and Dawkins, and I think yeah. I wondered if, because it's it was characterized as a conversation, if that's why it went so beautifully, because it really is the gold standard of scientific debates. Like it's just a, indeed. It was a I, I think it was a. I think it was a debate. It was called a conversation at Rich's request, and I agreed with that. And I don't mind whether anyone calls it a conversation or a debate, but I totally agree. It, it's the it's the way debate should be done in uh, that kind of environment with courtesy and at least an attempt to understand the other side. I'm wondering if Dawkins understood what you meant by the type of cause. So he's not giving up genes as having an influence. He's not giving up any of that. It's this other type of cause. If he can agree on that, that's, that's all. He doesn't even have to agree on purpose because that's another assumption we're going to test. He can just agree it's not genes and we can move on. So if he could accept that argument, he will be left with the fact that, yes, genes in a sense are causal. They've got associations with all of this and they certainly are necessary for making all the proteins in our bodies. Isn't that enough? It's not but necessary. It's not necessarily needed because the function of the organism can continue even in its absence. Which is the heart of adaptability. Exactly. It is the heart of that. And for 95% of genes, that is true. You can knock one out and the rest of the organism will continue as so it would better. And of course, I put that point to him and he said, well, Dennis, yes, we all know about robustness. The question is, has he understood that that means that his nation of cause is in question? <laughs> it is, as Richard correctly said, and he said, look, Dennis, the problem is, if, if you're right, I and many other people have been wrong for 50 years. He's absolutely right, of course, but that doesn't defend the issue. <laughs> that only simply says, look, it's big, it's, it's really serious, and I couldn't agree more, it, it, it is serious. It's a very strange psychology that is developing here. Speaking of Richard, I got one response via email. Oh, right, okay. I reached out for comment, and he said, I have a whole chapter dealing with Dennis Noble in my next book, The Genetic Book of the Dead. It will be available in September. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm delighted. I'm delighted you will have a whole chapter dealing with me. I don't have much confidence in it really dealing with me. I, I asked if he would, if he had anything to anything additional to add to that, or anything to clarify, and I got well, no response. So that was it. Okay. 
Well, I, I well look. I'm very happy if he has a go. That that's fantastic. I I I long for the near Darwinist to have a go, <laughs> and and then we can have a proper <clears throat> discussion. But it would require what we're doing at the moment, which is dissecting out these fundamental distinctions between the different forms of causation. And without that, you don't have a proper science of causation. Well, I'll tell you what, when it comes out, let's touch base and we can go through that yes, chapter. <laughs> exactly. So I would be delighted to do that. Yes. So is it true, we, you mentioned this briefly, that um, there it's very hard in academia to talk about these ideas, these unorthodox ideas, and you didn't feel you could actively start being head of this movement until you retired in 2004? 2004 is when I retired from being a, a professor running a big laboratory. I was therefore from there on no longer responsible for applying to research organizations for grants to support the salaries of people in my group. So I was no longer in a position in which my own unorthodox views could damage the careers of people working in my laboratory. That's the reason I only started writing in 2004. And the first publication was The Music of Life, which indeed is very clear about dissenting from the standard neo-Darwinist synthesis. So all the way from 2006, I've been so very clear about that. It I had been, as indeed I was for the first 10 years or so when I came out, if that's the right way of putting it, on this issue, uh, I was denigrated and with some pretty uh, strong language. If that had damaged my reputation to the point at which it would have been difficult for me to get the grant money that would support the salaries of a team, I would in effect by my own actions in relation to expressing my views on evolution have damaged their careers. As simple as that, I couldn't do that. In doing background research, I found Noble's been on the receiving end of some fairly vulgar attacks from other biologists. So I asked Noble if responses to his research and ideas are changing at all. In 2016, together with Two other scientists and two philosophers, I organized a meeting at the Royal Society in London, the top academy of the United Kingdom, together with also the British Academy, which is the social science side of all of this. And we organized a meeting on new trends in evolutionary biology. That meeting triggered a major protest from leaders of the neo-Darwinist synthesis there was actually a protest to try and stop the meeting happening in the form of a signed letter to the president of the Royal Society saying, please dissociate the society from this meeting. So that meeting went ahead. There's a history to that, which we don't need to go into, but it was quite a difficult history. The interesting thing is this. Since that meeting, I am no longer attacked. The silence from the other side is deafening. Has there been any response to the nature review that I did a few weeks ago with the very provocative title, Genes Are Not the Blueprint for Life? Nobody's replied. I look forward to a reply, but there's been no reply either to the articles that were published in 2017 after that 2016 meeting at the Royal Society. I think there was a tipping point there. Gene-centric paradigm? That's, that has to go. This is Joanna Xavier, a bioengineer specializing in systems biology and origins of life research. Xavier studied under Noble and went on to collaborate with Stuart Kaufman, identifying emergent autocatalytic networks in ancient bacteria as potential candidates for how life emerges. Xavier started the Origin of Life Early Career Network that now has over 200 interdisciplinary researchers from around the world. This group co-authored an inaugural paper to start a new chapter in the field. I'll be posting the full interview with Joanna. I'm glad to see Dennis making so much progress there. It's urgent and that has implications that stretch far beyond science. What do I find now? I meet young people doing research in my own university and in other universities, 
who are working within a paradigm that is totally different from the neo-Darwinist paradigm. Can they do so? Yes, they can. Do you think, though, in terms of just having these theories that have robust evidence for so much of them, and then there's assumptions placed on them to sort of tell a story, a cohesive story, do you think there's a way we could potentially, going forward, see how often this is flawed? Like, to take Kant, for example, he had an incredible story about how the mind worked. And so much of those pieces underpin science we have today. But he tied it up in a, in a great little bow to tell a story. And it, the whole story itself was wrong. But we want to tell a story. So I wonder if there's a way that when we, we have models and we tell stories about how something works, we can look at the evidence and then parse apart our assumptions and go, let's have this team of scientists run off with an assumption to, t to tell the story this way, and this team run off and tell the story this way, and all, both of them have the evidence, and we'll just see who's more right after 20 years. Indeed so. I, 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 I give way to the philosophers on everything to do with you needing to have certain things and ideas in place before you can even do science. That's correct. Yes, science is not a blank sheet that starts with no assumptions whatsoever. That kind of science is just stamp collecting. We just collect facts. And I'm not doing that. I realize that. But so it, it strikes me, though, that assumptions are being taken as evidence, right? Because that's how this got so entrenched. So is there a way to sort of disambiguate between the evidence we have and the assumptions we need to make this model work and test it? And then we can we cannot dig so deeply into it that it becomes a fight and you're picketed when you give a lecture. I would not. I like that approach. Um, I would love to find a way of defusing the tension and the the standing off that we experienced, for example, at that Royal Society meeting in 2016. There were just a few near darwinists at the meeting, and um, it was like a gladiatorial confrontation. And I don't think that's necessary. So I'm with you in the sense that surely we can find a narrative, I think what you're calling a story. Um, okay, it's a story, a narrative. A model. I don't mean to call it a story. That's too glib. Model. But I'm trying to arrive at a point which I can say, I don't think we, any of us, seriously disagree about six or so major features of the story I'm telling. In which case, why are we having the argument? Well, this is this is the this is sort of the bigger question that I'm trying to get at is I presume that this has real world significant practical implications for the development of therapies and treatments and, and oh, medicine. Absolutely. It's critical to the future of healthcare. Francis Collins, who led the genome project in the United States, put it very well in the lecture he gave we will have the cures for cancer, cures for cardiovascular disease, cures for Alzheimer's, cures for schizophrenia. But where are all the genetic cures? They don't exist. Where will they be? They won't exist. Look, this approach doesn't work. What will work? I think I know one possible way forward, but that means you're going to have to respect the integrative aspect of any living organism to probe its ability to switch from this to that, say disease state to non-disease state or whatever it might be, by much more subtle methods focusing on a higher level of organization. I recently met at Stanford University in its BioX facility, which is an institute for bringing the different disciplines together. This is a, a young scientist who is trying to investigate Alzheimer, but taking the view that the top priority is to restore function, not to find a gene for Alzheimer. So I think it, it is absolutely right for you to say, what's the narrative you're going to give? What what are you going to put in the place of something which has failed? And I think it's a perfectly valid challenge. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not even necessarily saying we should have a story. I just think that that's what we do to make a model. You take your evidence and you you we are story oh. makers and we need to be able to test something that we can make sense of. And so we put it into a story and that might just be two small assumptions. It could be very, it's not, it's not oh. like we're making things up. We just have to 
grant me these two things and this model works. Just I think we have to be so skeptical of those two assumptions instead of getting entrenched in this is what it is. I'm afraid we would have done better to back several horses at once. I say this not as somebody gloating over it because I, I face the same problem as many other people face in the families having to deal with serious illness, with social care that costs more than you can ever afford. So I've been through all of that. I know what, what, it, what it does to families too. And I, we've been told now that AI is going to help solve all these problems and, um, and expedite disease uh, treatments and, and, and new drug discoveries. Um, what I think is interesting is I heard Jeffrey Hinton, the godfather of AI, talk about how AI was set back because everyone believed Noam Chomsky's uh, theory of language, which wasn't evidence-based. On fact check, it was actually the CEO of Google DeepMind, Demis Hassabis, who said this in a conversation with Jeffrey Hinton when they were talking about the debunking of Chomsky's theory of language. And I just keep seeing this pattern of, of us being held back by these assumptions, and it's just- We have to back more than one horse in science. Do you have any thoughts on AI as a new intelligent thing? I think there's a very simple reason why AI won't do for us what we really want, which is in practice to create superhuman ability. Although this sounds crazy when you first state it, to create AI that would compete with our ability in creativity, we would require computers made not of silicon, not of solids, but of water. We are nowhere near knowing how to create computers based on water, and that's what a cell is. Now, why does that matter? In water, there is an enormous amount of stochasticity. All the molecules in our cells are wandering around in stochastic fashion. We harness that stochasticity, which is absolutely fast. And I don't think that AI based on silicon machines can possibly do that. When you say stochasticity, the unpredictableness that's found in these systems, is that what you're saying is the the sort of source of the creativity? Enormous. It's, it's in our cells at the molecular level, at the neural level, and certainly at the social level. I'm arguing that the characteristic of a human is that we are capable of harnessing that stochasticity. We channel it. Just as the plants worked out how to channel the stochastic arrival of photons from the sun into directed, guided creation of ATP. That was a brilliant harnessing of stochasticity. Those those particles arriving completely randomly, they are channeled by the plant into being a beautiful storehouse of energy which we can eat. The same thing applied to the immune system, telling the immune reproductive replicating molecules to generate millions of new DNA sequences and then choosing amongst them. Stochasticity is the center of creativity in organisms. To just try to nutshell what that means, is that is that uh, an organized whole, a Kantian whole's ability to take the unpredictable and make and yes. be creative with it, to be intelligent with it, exactly. to make predictions with creative it? Creative with precisely, which is what I think a Beethoven did, which is what I think almost any artist is capable of doing. The ability of humans, but of other organisms too, to be extraordinarily inventive is, I think, based on that harnessing of stochasticity. From the debate between you and uh, Dawkins, it didn't strike me that he was so as resistant to your ideas as I thought he might be. Um, He didn't know how to answer them. That's right. So he didn't challenge them directly. My, the, the, the thing I just want to impart to you is I, I would love in my lifetime to see you two be able to agree, oh, if only for the symbolism. And there's no gesture, I think, more honorable for a skeptic to be able to be skeptical of their own assumptions and theories. And that would be an incredible um, uh, gesture of integrity, intellectual integrity, I think, to be able to... to uh, to reassess 
and yes, I think that's right. Well, you know, um, I think Darwin did that throughout his life. He he did not think towards the end of his life as he thought at the beginning when he first published the Origin of Species. He came to understand that he had not explained the Origin of Species. That's quite something that there were other processes that had to be added in addition to natural selection. Wallace disagreed with him, and the rest is history. And if he had survived long enough, do you think we might be on a different trajectory? Oh, yes, indefinitely so. If Darwin, as he was at the end of his life, had won out and not been suddenly replaced, Weissman's barrier idea was published in 1883. Darwin died in 1882, so he didn't even know Weissman's idea. Oh. But we know from what he writes that he would have disagreed. So it was that critical. And it, it was unchallenged by Darwin because he died the year before. He died the year before, and that was then left to Romanes, his colleague, who worked with him for 20, no, about 10 years um, before Darwin died. They used to meet at Down House, the place where Darwin had his laboratory, his greenhouse where he had all the insectivorous plants and so on. Now, George Romanes wrote a three-volume book. I've got it in my library next door. Um, Darwin and After Darwin. It was published four years after Darwin died, 1886. It's all in there. And I'm in the process of resurrecting all of that, indeed already done so with an article in the Journal of Physiology explaining how Romanes and Darwin had a solution to the question of the origin of species, but it was not what Darwin published in 1859. I've got more bombshells to appear. But there's a vast story here. And it, it really goes back to those arguments in the 19th century. I have young people helping me with all of this because, believe me, I can't do all of this on my own. My point of view is a good time to be alive, and, and as it happens, I'm still alive. Yes. Yeah,